about getting started on uh, trying to understand uh, the concept of uh, what do we mean by uh, uh, the coherence. And uh, I'm going to actually spend uh, uh, most of the class today uh, uh, discussing about uh, uh, how does one fight uh, decay and decoherence, you know, in 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 materials, uh, uh, or in uh, to make the laser work. Right. So that's that's really the goal uh, uh, today. And uh, uh, hopefully by the end of the class today, at least you will have a, a very strong intuitive feel for what uh, makes the laser work. That's the, that's the goal today. Okay. So I think we got started uh, with uh, some of the uh, uh, the the things that uh, 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 kind of uh, make it make the light uh, have many wavelengths uh, and uh, incoherent, right? So today we'll see how we fight them. So uh, uh, what we'll start with is, is the concept of, of uh, 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 an, an, uh, a resonator. Right? So, so a resonator is the first step towards uh, that goal. And uh, a resonator, I think we have uh, uh, all uh, very reasonably good grasp over what is a resonator. I mean, a, a simple pendulum is a good resonator, right? So something that uh, uh, can uh, sustain a singular frequency uh, component and then oscillate for a reasonable amount of time. So, so, so for example, a, a, a pendulum or a swing, if you might, uh, would be a good resonator, right? I mean, it, it, it can oscillate if you let it go, uh, either due to the uh, pull of gravity, forces due to the pull of gravity, or, or uh, 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 and, and this is obviously w just one, one of the uh, thing, uh, uh, ways one can make a, a very simple resonator. Uh, you can make much faster resonators if we take, for example, uh, an inductor and a capacitor. And this is uh, uh, for those who are, uh, uh, you know, ha have a little experience in electrical circuits. Uh, uh, this, uh, if you try to apply a voltage across this, let's say, uh, let's say this is grounded, and we try to apply a voltage across it, as you know, uh, 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 if you uh, apply a DC voltage, nothing much happens, but if you apply an, any sort of AC oscillating voltage, uh, this simple circuit here has its own characteristic frequency at which it wants to, you know, oscillate. Right? Similarly, here, uh, I think we know that uh, the frequency uh, goes something like uh, L over gravity. Oh, sorry, was that gravity over in, uh, acceleration due to gravity over the length and things like that, right? So we, we know those. What are the frequencies? Uh, here, the frequency at which uh, this circuit wants to oscillate uh, would be something like that, right? 1 over 2 pi square root of LC. So the, the details are not very important, but I'm say, uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, this is a mechanical resonator, uh, and uh, uh, I I what it means is no matter how, uh, uh, w you know, if you want to kind of uh, 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 s make it oscillate at some other frequency, it won't. It would like to oscillate at its own re resonant frequency. It has a very characteristic frequency that it wants to oscillate. Similarly, the LC oscillator. Uh, it wants to oscillate at a certain frequency, and I think uh, you can also in very intuitively feel, uh, say that here you can go to many hi much higher frequencies because you're moving very light particles, which are electrons and electromagnetic waves. Here, these ma masses are heavier, so they oscillate a little slower. Or you can have a mass spring system and all kinds of things like that, right? So uh, now, uh, the, 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 the thing is, uh, um, both this, these oscillators uh, if you s set them going, or both these resonators, I'm not yet at an oscillator, if I set them going, it's going to do something like this. And, and we'll draw immediately after we understand this concept with the uh, you know, simpler things, how to do this with light, which will lead to the laser. But let's first look at just these two. Right? So uh, uh, I think it's a very uh, uh, classic example that if you, uh, you know, a child is on a swing and you're trying to uh, make the swing go, uh, and you, you know, just push once, then you know it, it will also, uh, res it will basically go back and forth a few times and stop, right? I mean, that's very uh, natural. And the reason for that, obviously, uh, things like there's air loss, there's friction on the top, etc. So the losses. Right? So losses are what cause the amplitude of vibration, uh, amplitude of vibration to decrease and gradually die down. Right? The frequency doesn't change, but the amplitude changes, right? 
So, so that's, that's, uh, that's what's uh, happening here. Uh, now, uh, uh, so, so, so uh, clearly, uh, in order to fight that decay, let's draw this. Uh, and then again, now this is a generalized coordinate. It could be the amplitude of uh, the you know, a swing going this way, or amplitude of a voltage that's oscillating here, let's say. Uh, uh, so so the, the, this is the amplitude, and this is time. And what we're saying is uh, you know, we can kind of get it started at some time, but uh, uh, because of these losses, it, it, it goes and then essentially decays. And there's a certain characteristic time constant so uh, which, which is uh, uh, e to the power minus t over tau. Sometimes you can say a rate. Uh, 1 over tau is the rate, or sometimes it's re represented by, number, uh, uh, by the uh, uh, variable gamma. And that's, that's, that's the rate at which uh, it decays. Right? So how do we straighten it out? How do we make sure that it doesn't decay? What do we do here? Right? So amplitude stays on. So what do we do here? So anybody who wants to take a shot at this? Yep, please. Right, that's right. So you have to drive it, meaning you have to, you know, intuitively give, give it a little kick every, you know, every cycle, for example, right? And you have to give, to fight the loss, you have to have another, uh, uh, you, you have a way to give it some amount of gain or to, so, that, so that it recovers after every little cycle. Right? So you have to have gain. And that's what I, we want to kind of start with. What is gain and how do we get it in various systems? And then you have to drive it with a system that provides energy uh, uh, which uh, is responsible for, uh, for the gain which will straighten this out. So, so that's really what we are after. If that's the time domain uh, uh, picture of those oscillations, I think we have already talked about the frequency domain let me just call it f for now. Uh, so the frequency is still, it has its unique frequency, beta 1 over square root LC, or this you know, uh, pendulum frequency. But because of the decay, uh, uh, instead of a very sharp frequency, uh, I think we have talked about that, that it actually uh, becomes broadened. And the line shape of it can be essentially, it's a Fourier transform of a sine times a decaying exponential. And that, that is proportional to 1 over tau, right? So, so the broadening. Now, uh, if, we are, if I'm ab able to provide gain by uh, you know, pushing uh, uh, the swing uh, every time it uh, you know, comes near me, then uh, uh, in principle, at least, you can make it go forever. Right? It can oscillate every time you recover that little, little bit of loss. And I think you also realize that the, uh, the uh, way uh, you are driving the system should be in phase with the system, because otherwise, there'll be a bit more disaster. Right? I mean, so, so uh, you have to be in phase with, with uh, the, the, the way you drive the system as well. Right? So, so that's also clear. Uh, and when you do that, uh, this, this essentially uh, recovers, right? And, and you get back your full uh, amplitude, and, and this becomes extremely sharp. So, so that's uh, uh, the, the, the influence or the effect of gain is to do that. So it uh, recovers the amplitude and makes the frequency domain sharp. And I think we have talked about this in some, some amount of detail in the last class, that uh, a laser is really the most, one of the most characteristic things about the laser is the wavelength is very sharp. Therefore, the frequency is very sharp because the product of those two is just the speed of light, which is clamped. It's fixed. Right? So, so, so if we, one is uh, sharp, the other is sharp. So, the, so, so as a result, a laser can be thought to be uh, because of its you know, singular, very sharp wavelength, also an oscillator, and uh, I'll you know, discuss this in uh, uh, detail today, uh, laser is a very similar thing to these oscillators. Uh, 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 and it also has a very sharp frequency given by you know, a resonant frequency. And that, that's why it has a sharp wavelength as well. So, so that's the first thing. OK, so let's look at how one might uh, provide gain into one of these, uh, these systems, and then we'll move over. To, to the laser, right? So, so for example, what do you do? Look at the electrical circuit. We know that here we can make it such things oscillate uh, at uh, you know uh, gigahertz sort of frequencies and slower for sure. But how would you provide gain into such a system? How well, how does one typically do it in, in electrical engineering? Making a radio or something like that? Yeah. A power source. A power source, right? In what form? So. Sorry. Yeah. 
uh, a battery, AC battery. So uh, yeah, but in a slightly different format. You know, I think you're right. I mean, you do need to apply power supply, uh, and you want to, but you need to provide uh, a gain. Uh, meaning a battery should be able to handle this sort of a frequency because, as you know, if this, you know, if 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 uh, on a uh, now the planet, the gravitation is too strong. I, I cannot push fast enough, right? So, so it must have a certain capabilities. Think those. Yeah, please. Yeah, and amplifier, right? So essentially, I think maybe that's exactly where you were going uh, with the power source, but it's in the form of a, uh, an amplifier, right? And op amp is a good example. But even simpler than that, I mean, we can get by at this stage because we are not talking about too much about electrical circuits with an even simpler thing. So, which electrical device has gain? You know? Which electrical device has gain? Uh, yeah, oh, yeah, but of course, yeah, the transistor, right? So that has gain. That's an amplifier. That's the. Uh, I mean, it used to be the vacuum tube, and and uh, now it's the transistor. It's a three-terminal device. It has gain. So what what does that mean? Just as an example here, uh, an electrical circuit. Uh, uh, what one, one might do is, is uh, uh, bring in a transistor, MOSFET, bipolar transistor, whatever you, know, you prefer. And what you want to do is uh, essentially you realize that, that the losses here are because of the resistance. Right? There is a finite amount of resistance in this circuit, and that's why you have losses. You can take this circuit and you make it out of uh, metals that can at low temperature be superconducting, and then it will oscillate for a very, very long time you know, when you take away the resistance completely, when it's superconducting. Right? But you know, at room temperature, uh, uh, well, we wish there was a room temperature superconductor, but not yet. So, uh, 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 so room temperature has finite losses, which is why it decays. And, and, and therefore, uh, what you can do is, I mean, this is just a kind of the uh, very uh, crude way of uh, uh, doing the amplification. So what you do is kind of essentially if you put another inductor, or essentially this could be just metal lines close to it, and, and essentially drive you know, this signal into the gate of a transistor and you know, ground the other end. So uh, this part of it, of this circuit, is going to give you gain. You know, and what does that mean? It means, uh, so here's your, uh, here's your resonator. It wants to resonate at a certain frequency. It tries, but without the gain, it decays. Now, the moment I add gain to this uh, system, what, what I'm claiming is I can actually let it, let it go, and, and essentially it will oscillate for as long as you want it. So, 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 uh, so the, what does a transistor do? Well, it will uh, pick up a little oscillation here, right? and it will try to flow into the gate. But I think you know that. Uh, uh, well, so I, I didn't complete the circuit, so let me finish the circuit here. So you feed the drain uh, uh, end of the current into this device, and uh, the drain current in a transistor is the gain times, uh, you know, the gate current. It's a small signal, oscillatory part of it. You know. so, so if you have an oscillating current or a voltage, uh, oscillating voltage that gets in here, the current that flows here will be amplified by the gain. So, so right. So, so, so as a result, the current, if it's decaying, this is able to provide you a certain amount of gain. And this is a feedback because it's directly connected. You know, these two are directly connected. And that's part of a circuit. But I, I, or at least hopefully the intuition, intu intuition is clear that I'm actually doing something here to boost the signal. And that something is provided by this transistor, so that gain. Yeah. So, so essentially, if you have a, you know, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, microvolt sort of uh, oscillatory signal here, then it for, because the you know output is is uh, the output it, it, there's a voltage amplification, so so essentially it, it boosts back to say maybe millivolt or you know whatever is the gain thousand or ten thousand whatever that is, right? so going to push it back. Right? And uh, another very important thing is the gain. If you look at the gain of a transistor or the voltage gain, for example, and you plot it versus frequency. Actually, let me plot it right there because we, we have that. So, so here's, let's say, the LC oscillator resonant frequency. Now, how should the gain spectrum look? I mean, the, gain, the transistor can provide gain, but it has its own limitations too. If you try to ask it to provide gain at 1,000 terahertz, it, it will not be capable to do it. If you apply, ask it to provide gain at 1 kilohertz, it's not a problem for most transistors, right? But what I'm trying to say is most transistors have a cutoff frequency above which even the transistor is not able to provide gain. And that gain 
a spectrum of a transistor typically would look, you know, they'll begin uh, at whatever value, you know, maybe 100 or 1,000, something like that, and then it will essentially drop. There's a cutoff frequency of the transistor, right? So, so there's a Ft or F max. I mean, these are the things that typically people talk about, uh, unity gain cutoff frequency or power gain cutoff frequency. Uh, I mean, this is qualitatively what I want to get to. This is the gain spectrum of a transistor. At DC, it, no problem. It can provide a lot of gain. But as you increase the, you know, uh, uh, if you, uh, you know, increase the stakes here, by going to higher and higher frequencies, at some point, it, it does, is not able anymore because of losses and resist RC losses and all kinds of other things. Right? So clearly, in order to be able to drive that oscillator, your gain spectra should cover that particular F not, otherwise you're not in business, right? Does it, I mean, that's very clear, that if, it, if your transistor had this, it, it's not going to be able to provide gain for you. So that's, that's uh, for, the, uh, for the electrical circuit. So I mean, uh, again, the, the exact details is of this is not very important now, right? But, but at least the intuition, if you feel that you understand it, great. If not, I, I would like to just pause and address any questions. So again, I mean, so you have a resonator, it starts, oscillating but then it decays but the if I can provide gain back and it's gain and essentially you have a feedback too because this this is electrically really connected the current flows through the LC oscillator down to ground through the transistor so the gain so there's a feedback into the system as well so it's, a, it's a positive feedback and with the positive feedback you can sustain uh, oscillations for a long time nothing to say about coherence I mean about phase and all but essentially if you have one LC oscillator driving it with a voltage source. Uh, uh, again, so, so here what you would be doing you'd, is you'd be reading out the voltage from this terminal and, and uh, if without the transistor, uh, if without the transistor it did you know, that, now with the transistor, the, the max would be slightly lower. I think you know that if you have a feedback, the max goes down a little bit. But now, now it will not decay, you know, so it will go, keep going. Right? So, so that's that. Okay, any questions? <laughs> well, uh, if not, let's go over to the uh, uh, to the to the part of uh, light. Okay, so light. Uh, so what what we want to do? So if you can make resonator and g provide gain, uh, the two of them will give you an oscillator. Oscillator. Okay. All right, gain plus uh, uh, resonator will give you an oscillator. Right. So let's actually uh, erase the electrical circuit part of it and look at how does it look for a laser or light. You know, how, how does one build this sort of an oscillator for light? And I, I hope you uh, uh, appreciate now why do we want a light oscillator? Because you see, we talked about the laser having a unique frequency. So obviously, I want a single frequency of light, right? And, and uh, or single wavelength, or in other words, a single frequency. Therefore, the problem, at least qualitatively, is exactly the same as the LC oscillator, right? And now we want to see how does one build a resonator uh, for, for, for light, and then how does one provide gain for light, and how does one combine these to get the laser. Right. So, so that's what we want to see. So, uh, okay, so, so I think that's uh, uh, the uh, way, uh, uh, sometimes there's a little confusion as to what do you mean by uh, providing uh, or making an oscillator uh, with light because light, the electric field is already oscillating, right? I mean, that's true. The electric field is oscillating at a unique frequency. So is the uh, magnetic field. And we are going to get to all that through Maxwell's equations uh, uh, today and uh, for, you know, next class as well. But uh, uh, the way we want to actually look at uh, a resonator for light is uh, um, uh, we want to actually be able to uh, select uh, uh, a very uh, uh, unique frequency because we want to go towards a laser. And typically that is not available to you. I mean, a, a laser, uh, typical light sources are all broadband. We talked about black body radiation, which is you know, very broadband. Uh, light bulb has uh, you know, reasonably large bandwidth, uh, very not very sharp. So how do you actually select only a few modes of light? You know? so, so maybe uh, you know, maybe one mode or a few modes. So how does one build? a resonator with light? That's the first question. So what do we do? So I think you could kind of see from the earlier analogies that, that you know, there must be something to do with bouncing back and forth, right, between something. And that's how you make any, any oscillator, any, any resonator, right? So how do you build one with light? Maybe somebody wants to take a 
uh, answer that. Yeah, sir? A cavity, right? So that's the word, that's right. So you basically put it between mirrors, right? You reflect it back and forth between two mirrors, right? Example, simplest example. There are many ways you can do it. But uh, so what you can do uh, is you, you take two mirrors, right? And, and, and then uh, you let uh, how exactly we're going to create the light and start it off, we'll come to that. Right? But essentially the idea is uh, you have a light beam that goes to the right, sees a mirror, reflects, right? comes back, sees a mirror, reflects, and now you have this oscillation or the resonant, this is a resonant cavity for light. Light bouncing back and forth between two mirrors. Very simple, that the, probably the simplest example of, of a resonator for light. And this was also, uh, uh, you know, Einstein's original idea to build uh, the simplest notion of a clock, uh, because an, every oscillator is a clock. I think you can see that uh, if your length uh, here between the two mirrors is L, and the speed of light is c, uh, uh, then, then, then obviously it's going to take, uh, you know, to start and come back here, it's going to take c over 2l, you know, that, that sort of, that's the frequency at which this thing will oscillate, or uh, the time it will take is uh, 2l over c. So, so and, and then there'll be a, if, you're, if you have just a pulse of light going, it'll go and come back, and there'll be a click and click, and so that, that's your clock, right? It's the simplest idea of a clock, right? And that's what, for Einstein, this led to the discovery or you know, him, him uh, uh, developing the whole theory of relativity because he says, well, what if my mirrors were moving and all that sort of thing, and then that's how you know, relativity emerged. But we'll start here and say that, well, nothing is moving right now for us. I mean, these mirrors are still, and the only thing moving is obviously light, and it's going back and forth, and here's the situation. Uh, this is a light resonator. So, so. And I think you probably also realize that you can build this in many ways. You, know, you can have this is uh, abstraction. Actually, this is a reality in many lasers. I mean, you have two mirrors. But you can have many other kinds. You can have uh, some fancy ones. You know, there, there are some uh, which would be you take a disk and you let the light go that way and then it reflects back and forth. These would be, you know, whispering galleries. I mean, so, so these are called whispering gallery resonators. You have all kinds of fun resonators. You have ring resonators, uh, all kinds. But let's discuss this. It's a simpler one to discuss, I mean, to, to understand. You know. So you build a resonator like that for light, and now ask the question: Now, uh, how does it look? In, in you know, how, how do things look for for the for this resonator of light instead of an LC oscillator? How does it look here? Right? So uh, now I think you know uh, that light. Uh, uh, if you choose a certain wavelength, right, uh, then. Uh, 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 these are two mirrors. You can think of them as, as of now as, let's say, metal plates, very sh you know, smooth metal plates. Smoothness is much, the roughness is much lower than the wavelength of light. So it's, it's a really nice reflective mirror. Uh, initially, we are going to talk about, let's say we have superconductors here, no resistive loss, you know, conductivity is infinite and all that sort of thing. Actually, uh, for visible light, superconductors are also lossy, but uh, uh, that, you know, let's assume there's no loss initially. But uh, the first thing we want to start off by saying is, uh, is, is uh, let's say I chose a certain, uh, rather, this cavity will only allow certain wavelengths inside it. It won't allow all wavelengths. You know, just like the LC oscillator only allows a frequency of, you know, 1 over square root LC. Similarly, the LC resonator. Similarly, this particular resonator for light is only going to allow certain wavelengths. Right? And I think we know that uh, the wavelengths that will fit inside there are uh, uh, because these are conductive surfaces, if I were to plot the electric field, which, you know, let's say the electric field is this way, and we're going to talk about this uh, Maxwell, you know, for, uh, in quite some detail, and so E cross H uh, is the direction in which the electric field and magnetic field is in which the e electromagnetic wave is going, and then flex, flex and all that. So uh, if you plot the electric field amplitude again, uh, so, so the wavelengths that fit inside this resonator you know, the longest wavelength that fits is one that has a half wavelength. I mean, we're saying the electric field goes to zero at the two ends. I mean, one way to look at it is, you know, electric field times distance is a voltage, right? And this is a metal, and there's no voltage drop across a metal, so this is zero. It's clamped. The electric field is zero at the two ends, right? So that's a boundary condition, you know, the Maxwell boundary condition. Uh, okay, so that's the first uh, mode. Uh, this is a mode of, you know, wavelength or light that will fit. But then you can obviously also have, you know, this wave, and you can have a lot of shorter waves com compared. You know. But there's a discrete number. That is the important thing. It's a discrete number of such 
wavelengths that will fit inside the <coughs> resonator. Okay. It's, it's a, not a continuum, but a discrete number. Right? And it's very easy to write it down because you see this is half a wavelength. And you always have an integer multiple of half a wavelength that will fit inside that resonator, an integer number. Let's label that integer by small n. And then we write small n times half a wavelength should be equal to the length of the resonator. And obviously, that's your condition. Those are the wavelengths that you can fit inside. This is, you know, if you have done courses, you've probably seen many times. But this is very important now for the laser. This is very important. So as a result, uh, you can right away see that the uh, wavelengths that fit inside there are 2L over uh, uh, you know, N right? from here. And uh, n is not 0, but 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, you know, all integers. Right. So from here, uh, what I'm really after is uh, one can talk about wavelengths, but I want to talk about frequency. So I want what are the frequencies that fit for light now. And that's easy, because frequency times this is speed of light. Right? And, and uh, uh, now the frequency is also discrete. Not all, all frequencies are allowed. Right. So free fn times lambda n is equal to speed of light c. And therefore, the uh, frequencies that are allowed would be c over you know, this quantity, which would give you c over 2L times an integer. And that those are the frequencies that are allowed for light inside that resonator, or the cavity, if you might call it. So resonator and cavity are used interchangeably. So we, we're going to use resonator because this is an EC course. So we talk about it. Yeah. I think we, we also talk about cavities, but uh, maybe a bit, bit more about circuits. So we talk a little bit about resonators more. But all right. So those are the uh, fre frequencies. If you want your omegas, uh, you just multiply this by 2 pi. I'm, I'm going to just write it down for completeness. Omega n is 2 pi times the frequency. And that is going to give you n times, uh, did I do this? Uh, yeah. So basically, there will be a c times pi over l, right? So the 2 pi, the 2 and 2 will cancel. You get a pi c over l and times n. So, so these are the uh, fundamentally allowed frequencies in that, uh, for light in, in, inside that resonator. Integer multiples of c over 2l in f in frequency, or c times pi over l in omega space. So. Let's make a plot of it, right? So we erase the one for the LC oscillator and make a similar plot. Uh, we, uh, not worried about that right now. We make a similar plot for the light oscillator, which is going to lead towards the laser. So I think uh, right away you see that there are, you know, only certain frequencies allowed. So it, it's it's a train of such frequencies, e equispaced, such that f n is an integer times c over 2l, right? That's what we just saw. And the spacing between them, and these are called modes. The spacing is oh, C over 2L. Right? That's the spacing between the two modes. <coughs> and one can uh, you know, look at a, an example. Uh, for example, for exa let's say let the length is uh, one meter. This is obviously a very large tabletop laser, uh, one meter. And let's say your wavelength. Uh, of, la of, the, of the laser that you are looking at is, is uh, 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 let's say it's uh, one micron, so that would be 1,000 nanometers or uh, 10 to the power minus 6 meters, right? So uh, uh, the moment you say this is my wavelength, that means you have picked up one of these, one of these frequencies, just one, right? Not, not you know, there's no uncertainty to that, it's just one, right? And that can tell you what is your n, how many, how many you know, oscillations are you go going between the two? You know, how many waves uh, have you completed uh, between the two? And I'm not doing this now, but you can show that if, you're, if this is your wavelength, you would be kind of looking at about a million cycles between the two. You know? So, so there will be about a million that will go between the two. Right? So, so you can sh show that, uh, and, and meaning that n would be about a million. Or it could be larger, I'm depending on, 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 on these numbers here. And the frequency, I think we have already talked about, is of the order of 100 terahertz. 100 terahertz is kind of the order of magnitude of the <coughs> frequency uh, of this mode. So it's 100 terahertz. And the spacing, this you can kind of right away see. What is the spacing? Speed of light meters per second over 
two L, so two times one meter, right? So that's uh, 150 uh, one over second, so of the order of 150 gigahertz, right? right? Order of magnitude. Uh, 150, oh no, 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 what did I do here? Is this correct? Uh, no, 150 megahertz, right? Uh, 1.5, and I pull out two zeros from here, put it here, so we're left with six zeros, so that's megahertz, right? 150 megahertz. But uh, what I'm trying to say is, as you know, uh, we are at, we are looking at 100 terahertz, let's say, a center frequency, you know, from zero is way out there, but the width, or essentially the spacing between them is, is, is it's, it's reasonably close, uh, closely spaced compared to this, right? Does that make sense? I mean, so, so the spacing is, is, is 150 megahertz, uh, which is orders of magnitude lower than the center frequency of this, you know. Okay, so that's the uh, optical resonator, and you see, unlike the LC oscillator, you have many modes, not just one, you have many modes. And each mode is a separate LC oscillator. Each mode, is a, that's the way to look at it, is a separate LC oscillator. Slightly different L, slightly different C, if you might. And it's a separate oscillator. And, uh, 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 and, 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 and remember, this is, uh, uh, these are the modes that are allowed inside the cavity. And now what, what you actually have is going to depend on what you're going to you know, put into it, right? So, so what, what, what are you going to drive into it? But these are the only ones that are allowed. For example, if I start it off, if I somehow inject light into that cavity uh, or, or, or resonator at this frequency, then uh, uh, the question really is whether it will stay in that frequency or it will try to go into other modes and that sort of thing. That's really what we're asking at this point. Yeah. But uh, is that clear, at least, that you will get a you know, series of frequencies and a series of modes that are allowed inside that resonator, and therefore it is like a set of LC oscillators, not just one. Any questions? Yeah, please. So if you wanted a single frequency operation, you want more spacing as far as possible? That's a great question. I'm getting there now, right? So, so no, uh, yeah, a uh, very good question. So, uh, yeah. Um, so we are going to say that how do you then pick out one single mode and and uh, and then do such things like that. So the uh, other thing now is one, I want to say that now let's remove and bring in real remove the you know ideal conditions and bring in a little bit of reality by saying that these mirrors typically will not be perfectly reflective. There will be a certain amount of uh, you know uh, if if I have you know. Uh, a milliwatt incident, maybe what's going back is you know 99%, but not 100%. There'll be some amount of absorption, some amount of leakage, and that sort of thing. Right? So there'll be loss. And as a result of the loss, uh, these are you know the the the, the, broaden, the 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 broadening of each one of these is is very much similar to the LC oscillator broadening. It's the same thing. There's a loss, just like the resistor in the LC oscillator. There is optical loss. Light is lost. You know, if you start off a pulse now, you know, and come back after two days, there will be nothing left. Light would have left this cavity. It would have been, you know, either absorbed into heat or be, you know, uh, going out uh, all the way somewhere, right? So, so it won't be left here. So essentially it won't. Uh, so that needs also replenishing. Uh, and therefore, uh, what you need to do now is, uh, uh, so you built a resonator for light, and it has this set of frequencies. Now we want to see how do you give it gain. And that's the most, one of the most interesting things uh, about the laser, because pe before, the, before they actually made the laser, this was, uh, you know, people were not very doubtful that you can actually have gain for light. You know? and, and that was kind of the more interesting part of the story. So essentially, just like you put a transistor in our electrical circuit, here what we are going to do now is put something here, which is we are going to call as the gain medium. It's the gain medium that is going to amplify your light, instead of amplifying your voltage or current, it's going to amplify your electromagnetic field. So that's what it means. So this is your gain medium. So I want to provide you know, the second part uh, ingredient here, which is gain. It's a gain medium. And what is this? Typically, uh, it can be many things. Uh, uh, you can, uh, uh, let me just start by saying, you know, for, for most cases we'll discuss in this course, the gain medium will have matter in it. The gain makes use of matter. You need, you know, uh, this, you need energy levels and atoms and that sort of thing <coughs> to give it gain. Yeah. 
And then we are going to discuss now why, uh, why does matter and how can matter give you gain. And, uh, and this is probably the, you know, one of the more critical concepts we, I want to get through right now. Again, no, no equations at this point. I mean, it's just, if you get the idea, I think uh, uh, I've said that we have the whole semester to figure out all the other details and equations. But uh, at this point, it's uh, based on intuition and you develop it. So, so gain medium, as an example, if you look at a, um, let's say a tie sapphire laser. Now that, in, in that material, this will be a sapphire crystal. And inside it would be embedded these titanium atoms. And the titanium atoms will have the electrons at these energies. You know, and when the light goes through, the light is going to you know, kick off electrons this way and interact with it very strongly. There will be strong light matter interaction. And the gain medium is basically titanium atoms inside sapphire crystal. That's a tie sapphire gain medium, for example. All kinds of gain medium. You can have a semiconductor. You can have uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 a gas, uh, a helium, cadmium, a laser, and all this. You can have all kinds of gain medium, but it needs matter, typically. For most cases we talk here, I mean, there are some cases where you can get around, which is a free electron lasers and that sort of thing. But let me just say that you have an, uh, something that is analogous to the transistor for electrical circuits, but it's, uh, 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 yeah, and, and, and it has matter. And what it will do, and we'll talk about how it does it, but what it will end up doing is it's going to give you gain, just like the transistor was giving you gain over a certain frequency range, right? That gain medium or amplification medium is going to have its own gain spectra and it may look, I don't know, something like that. We have to choose the right one. We have to choose the right one. It will have its own bandwidth. So this is uh, now our gain medium uh, uh, and the gain, uh, this material, whatever atoms we choose, whatever material we choose for providing optical gain or photonic gain, it will have its own frequency, it, uh, center frequency, it will have its bandwidth as well. Is that clear? I mean, whatever, uh, at least conceptually, it's clear that it will have a certain bandwidth. And that is how uh, we select which mode are you going to want in the laser. This is how you select it. So by the choice of the gain medium. The gain medium is going to tell you, well, if you want a red laser, you ch you're, you're restricted in your range of this gain medium such that this you know, uh, window has the red wavelength, ins red frequency inside it. That, that's, and, and, and therefore, it, it fixes the uh, choices of atoms you can have or materials you can have because that, that clamps the energy. He says, well, red is, you know, let's say six, you know, 30 nanometer, 650 nanometer, then this is about such and such electron volts. Therefore, I want matter that has energy separated by this much. So, right? so that's a gain medium. Now, once you select that and you put that material in there, uh, uh, so, so, uh, so all of these other, I mean, what, what, as you can see that uh, you can now set off the uh, oscillator, just like you set off the transistor with the LC oscillator. And uh, what will happen is, you know, you can have any sort of light incident inside here. You can, uh, uh, I'm not yet, I've not yet told you how does it provide gain, but, uh, and I'm going to talk about that, uh, you know, uh, in, in the next few minutes. But uh, just as if it can provide gain, what it means is if, uh, if you have photons at this particular wavelength or at this particular frequency incident, if I have 10, sorry, instead of 10, let's say, you know, if I have uh, a million photons come in into the gain medium from this side, what will emerge on this side will be, you know, amplified. We have more light out than what is in. That's the meaning of gain. Meaning of gain, just like the transistor amplified voltages, uh, this thing is going to amplify your amplitude of the light. So if I have light of a certain intensity come in, it says your gain medium, so essentially it increases the amplitude and you get more photons out. So, so that's, that's the gain medium. Obviously, you know, you'd realize that it can't be an, a passive system. You have to supply energy, right? Otherwise, how are you getting more out than what's coming in? And yeah, you will be, just like a transistor would be biased under certain DC conditions, you're going to give it DC energy and it's going to amplify AC power oscillatory power, right? So it's converting DC into AC. Similarly here, you're going to pump in uh, maybe a broadband light source, you're going to, have to excite things, and that energy which is incoherent, which is broadband, is going to be all pulled and pushed into this particular wavelength at this particular frequency, is going to amplify that. So it, 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 uh, that, that's what the gain medium is going to do. 
And uh, uh, what we want to obviously see is, is uh, so as a result, what will happen is there are finite losses for all these other modes. And as a result, these modes will die down. They will not survive because you know, losses kick, uh, you know, essentially take out the energies. But uh, this one, this particular mode, had a certain band, you know, uh, broadening before you put in the amplifier. The moment you put in the amplifier and you actually uh, uh, make it, so, so there's a huge amount, uh, or there's a very large amount of sharpening of this mode too, you know, compared to the resonator. It becomes extremely sharp, right? And this, this uh, 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 line width narrows very dramatically when you actually uh, uh, are able to amplify the signal and, and get into the laser mode. So, right? so meaning the line width of this is a certain number, uh, maybe tens of gigahertz. If you don't put the amplifier, then once you put the amplifier in, it goes down by a factor of thousand or a million, depends on how, you, how well you made it. It really sharpens, it makes it very, very sharp and single frequency. Yeah. So it's not, not just selecting out one mode, it's also sharpening the, the line width. So that, those are two things that the amplifier does for you. Okay, so uh, let's now look at the question of gain because that's obviously absolutely uh, the central part of, of, of this picture and probably the more very interesting part of how, does, uh, uh, how do you amplify or provide gain uh, uh, with light or you know, how do you get 10 photons in but 15 out from a material, right? So, so that's, that's a very interesting uh, problem. And uh, uh, this goes back really also to the uh, beginning of quantum mechanics and uh, uh, the first person to have kind of realized that this is possible is, uh, is Einstein uh, and, and you know, uh, the process is the following. Uh, this, these pictures, by the way, I'm showing are mostly from your book, so you can always uh, have a look. Uh, so let me, let me just uh, uh, write, uh, draw a few pictures here similar to that. So uh, we, we, we have uh, light a photon of a certain energy come in. And let's say I've chosen my right atoms here, you know, which, which have that particular transition energy. Let's say I've chosen the right atoms and the right materials. And, and I have electrons uh, sitting here, and the photon comes in. Uh, it has uh, energy of h bar omega, maybe one electron volt, maybe three, you know, whichever be it. So I have electrons sitting here. Here's energy one, energy two. And the photon what is a photon in the end? I mean, classically, it's an electromagnetic wave. It's an oscillating electric field, right? And what is an, ele well, electrons are in, in some sense also oscillating inside the uh, uh, atom. And, the, you know, if it's sitting here, uh, it's, it's uh, essentially doing, uh, you can kind of look at a Bohr orbit or, or, or de Broglie sort of picture. I and mean, essentially, it's also oscillating in, in, in a certain sense at a certain frequency and all that. And whenever there's resonance between the two, what does that mean? It translates just to the fact that if the h bar omega is e exactly equal to the difference of these two, this electron will absorb that photon. It will annihilate the fo photon from the electromagnetic field, and energy goes from light into matter. You know, so the matter gets excited, you know, so, so, right? So that's what happens. It ab gets absorbed, and it goes here into an empty state. And that's very, you know, uh, that, that, that's a standard process. So you have Instead of one photon, you had, say, a billion or 10 to the power 15 coming in, and there are a lot of atoms, and this uh, electron, so the solid line means there's an electron here, dashed line means no electrons, gets absorbed. This is before the event, this is after the event. Right? So if you have more light than their number of atoms, uh, then, then uh, obviously what has happened is you have absorbed some photons, and there are less number of photons coming out. A measure of the number of photons is the amplitude of the electric field. So this is pointing vector. We're going to cover that when we start Maxwell's equations in, 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 in proper detail. But that's, that's absorption. And that's typically, this is loss. Right? You lost light. You have lost the intensity. You had more light coming in than what's going on. Now, let's look at this situation. You have excited some atoms, and suddenly you turn off your light source. Now atoms are sitting, or electrons are sitting at the excited state. Right? But I think you know that they will not stay there for too long. Right? They're going to decay. Here's the situation. Before, no light, you turned off the light, but your electrons are sitting at a high energy, and then if you give it a certain amount of time, it's going to decay, and it's going to radiate out the electromagnetic wave. It's going to emit a photon, and that's spontaneous emission. It didn't need any help, it spontaneously emitted, the atom or the electron spontaneously emitted a photon. That's spontaneous emission. So those two processes are intuitive, and I think you understand. Typically, in an atom, 
Uh, it's an order of magnitude. Uh, it takes about a nanosecond, typically, a nanosecond to go from here to there. That's the time scale over which it does it, mm -hmm. a, a nanosecond. Not picosecond, and this is 10 to the power minus 9 seconds. And this is actually a limitation for switching many, if you have a device that b is uses spontaneous emission, you cannot switch it faster than, you know, roughly uh, 1 over a nanosecond, which is a gigahertz. You know, that's kind of a limitation for how fast you can make something on and off if it is based on spontaneous emission. But uh, these were obviously understood b much before, but uh, this part was kind of the tricky one. And this is where Einstein's uh, you know, uh, very intuition uh, came in. And what he, what he uh, said that, well, he, I'm going to ask a different question, that I have a situation where I do not have any, any electrons in the lower state, but I only have electrons in the upper state. Right? Only in the upper state, meaning the matter is already excited. And then I have a photon coming in, right? <coughs> right. Now what happens, right? Uh, this is a very interesting question, right? So you have an electron that's already sitting there at exactly that h bar omega energy as the photon comes in. But obviously, it cannot absorb another because then there's no energy state out there. So what is it going to do now? Right? And this is where uh, uh, what Einstein realized, and, and he showed actually, uh, that what this photon will do is it will stimulate or it will, it will force this electron to come down here. And what will come out after this is two photons. Not, right? So this is stimulated emission. <coughs> right? So if your electron is already sitting at a higher energy, at the higher energy, and your photon comes in, then if it was taking you a nanosecond to decay for spontaneous emission without the help of this extra photon. With this photon, you can push it down to much lower. It is going to emit much faster. Right? Does that make sense? It's much more likely to emit another photon now. So that's stimulated emission. It's, so the emission of the second photon here, if you might, is stimulated by the presence of the first. It did forces it. And the more the number of photons coming in, the faster it stimulates it. So essentially, it, it's kind of a positive feedback as well. I mean, it actually, uh, uh, and then this is, is related to the nature of photons, which are bosons, you know, unlike fermions, which are electrons. But that we don't need to bother about that at this point. But this is the basic idea of stimulated emission. And I think right away you can see from this picture that there is gain in the system. Right? If you can create matter which looks like this, and you feed in the right wavelength of light, if you have 10 photons coming in, you can get you know, 15 out. Right? That's optical gain. That's how you amplify light right? by stimulated emission. So, uh, is that clear? I mean, this, uh, this is an important concept in this course, right? Because m much of, uh, pretty much all lasers that we are going to talk about is based on this concept. Right? So this is stimulated emission, and this is where you need matter. And you can see this situation is highly unnatural. It is not the equilibrium situation. Equilibrium situation is electrons like to be here, right? This is here. Right? So here, uh, this is what you might refer. The, uh, there's a uh, the population of carry, uh, matter here at high energies is larger than at low energies. Therefore, it's inverted upside down, right? So this is population inversion. This is the gain medium for a laser is a, uh, where matter has population inversion. These are the you know kind of the jargon that we you hear. Uh, that make a laser tick, but this is a very important part. This is population inversion. You need that to amplify photons or light, it's stimulated emission. So, uh, so basically, now we have to put uh, that such matter into this material, uh, and then uh, as a result, uh, you can create gain. Uh, you have a certain amplitude of light coming in, proportional to say 10 to the power 9 photons coming in, and you have maybe 10 to the power 10 going out. The amplitude is bigger. So you have boosted the signal. Right. So, all right, so uh, we're kind of out of time today, but let me finish by just saying one more thing. So uh, what we'll see in the next class uh, is, is that uh, if I, uh, uh, okay, so let me finish by saying the following. So yes, now hopefully we understand that we have a light oscillator, or rather we have a resonator for light by building mirrors or many other ways. And you have a gain medium by using stimulated emission. And you basically have a light oscillator. So uh, as you know, I mean, the name looks like this, right? Uh, there's uh, amplification and stimulated emission, right? 
But I think you know that th this is not quite the right name, technically, because these two things are the same thing. Um, simulated emission is exactly the same as amplification or gain, right? Therefore, one of the inventors of the laser, Art Shallow, who won the Nobel Prize for it, said that, well, it shouldn't be called a light you know, amplification, but it should be called a, it's a really a light oscillator, right? But then you see they run into a problem with the name. <laughs> so, you know, and, and this is obviously not the good name to start with an object, <laughs> but technically that is correct. This is a light oscillator with stimulated emission of radiation. And I hope you can see all the reasons why. You know? So it's an oscillator which goes. So let's end it here today. And in the next class, we start with, uh, you know, beyond this. Hopefully it gives you a good feel for what is a laser. So. All right.